I'm Catalina Stefanescu Kunze. I'm Professor of Management Science here at ESMT Berlin. And I'm also the faculty lead of our new Masters in Analytics and Artificial Intelligence program, which will be kicking off the first cohort in September of this year. My background is in analytics and management science more broadly. I have uh, gotten my PhD in operations research at Cornell University in the United States. I started my academic career at uh, London Business School as assistant professor of uh, decision sciences. And since 2009, I have been here at uh, ESMT Berlin uh, doing research, uh, teaching and consulting on the applications of analytics to various um, public and business problems. How can analytics add value and uh, how can we do better analytics? Well, um, there is a lot of fields, a lot of applications in businesses where analytics can, uh, can add value. But uh, perhaps what is needed most of all is uh, people who can speak both the language of analytics and the language of business, people with a very strong foundation uh, in uh, business knowledge, in the functional fields of business, such as marketing, finance, operations, uh, HR, and so on and so forth. Uh, but also those who are equipped with the technical tools to understand how analytics can add value. Because what we have um, identified through uh, talking with many, many corporations and companies is that even though it is well established and it is well accepted that analytics can bring tremendous opportunities, in practice there is a little bit of a challenge in identifying exactly what value and what business cases can analytics help with. And uh, there's a simple reason for this, it's because um, many companies are investing a large amount of resources in analytics teams, in infrastructure, uh, but then the analytics teams do not necessarily talk the language of business and the business does not know what analytics can bring. And so there is this real need for um, individuals, for skilled professionals at the interface between business and analytics and data science who can identify uh, the added value and the use cases uh, for, for all of these uh, skills. Traditionally speaking, uh, there has been a, um, a way for individuals to reach these roles and this is coming from the profession, so starting off as a data analyst and then uh, growing up in the organization, having more and more senior roles and ultimately being able to identify these use cases. But uh, the limitations to this approach is, first of all, an issue of scale, because naturally, since this involving climbing up the car career ladder, we're talking about a funnel structure, so not many people arrive in these positions. And secondly, it's an issue of scope, because even arriving in such positions, usually the professional has only been exposed to one single part of the organization. Maybe they have seen marketing, but they don't really have experience of operations. Instead, um, our program is coming in to train students, to train participants uh, into filling this gap, into being analyst managers which doesn't mean managing analytics teams, although they may well do so. It really means being managers with a deep knowledge of analytics so that they can actually derive value. They can speak the language of both sides of the business. And we do so, um, first of all, by providing in the first year a, a selection of core courses that cover the uh, main functional areas of business. And then secondly, in our uh, follow-up courses, which are mostly about analytics, in making sure that every tool and every technique, every algorithm that we showcase and that we explore has an immediate practical application. So we illustrate this uh, with uh, its use in practice and uh, hopefully providing inspiration about how this can add value to the business. It's well known that uh, analytics and AI can, uh, can really revolutionize decision making in, in many different industries, starting from healthcare and finance to transportation and energy. There are many examples I could give, um, for instance, in finance, uh, analytics, uh, looking at um, transaction data, large amounts of transaction data and using artificial intelligence, one can easily detect uh, instances of fraud by flagging up 
and following up on potential unusual behavioral um, in, in transaction logs. Uh, but one area that I, I personally find fascinating and that is currently uh, really a, a hot field for analytics uh, is healthcare. Because here, looking at the um, huge um, richness of customer of uh, patient data and, uh, and uh, using artificial intelligence, uh, we really have a, an amazing potential of developing targeted uh, therapies for uh, CEOs and potentially rare diseases, such as personalized treatments for cancer. Um, also doing preventive um, health care, such as uh, allowing for um, early detection and, and preventing strategies in, in managing uh, the onset of disease. Um, it's, um, it, this kind of application has the potential, of course, to, to improve the quality of care. But it also has the potential of reducing costs and um, increasing the scope of healthcare delivery to parts of the population that are potentially underserved. So on the cost reduction um, uh, aspect, I could give the example of the use of artificial intelligence for analyzing uh, the images coming from radiology, so scanning uh, the output of CT scans or mammographies to um, offer uh, assistance to consultant radiologists in identifying potentially cancerous tumors. Uh, that releases the pressure on uh, very highly stretched resources and, uh, of course, um, it improves the accuracy of the prognosis. Of course, there's the traditional um, things that, uh, that one could think about, um, the uh, resources, the availability and investment in resources, and one could think about people, identifying um, analytical talent is uh, clearly a challenge, um, investing in uh, proper IT resources, in data management and, and uh, data protection services, it's, it's uh, crucial. Investing in the whole algorithmic infrastructure is, is very important. Uh, and with that, there are additional questions related to how this would um, fit into the organization. It's a question of culture, particularly in rather well-established um, hierarchical organizations where decisions used to be taken by seniority, by experience, um, by perhaps functional field. Um, bringing in a new approach of data-driven decision-making um, can potentially um, be a catalyst for change and change is not always comfortable or smooth and so there is a question of organizational culture and how to smooth this transition and to how to improve communication uh, when moving on to a different uh, type of decision making process there's also the very practical question of um, how should this be established in the organization if you have a new data science uh, group where should it sit? Should it be a group by itself, which then acts as an in-house consulting service, providing advice and, and um, support to the other areas? Or should it rather be um, dispersed, so having data scientists in marketing or data scientists in HR or data scientists in operations? So what's the appropriate organizational structure that best fits um, the company's goals and, and profile? And so we, um, we cover this in our program in, in various courses, in, um, in strategy, in organizational behavior, um, of course, in economics and finance. Uh, but I would um, come back to the main idea that perhaps the most challenging aspect that companies are facing now is uh, identifying the use to which analytics can be put and the value that uh, it can bring. So that's where human talent and skills are needed. Yeah, this is a this is a critical and a challenging uh, a challenging point because um, of course this is important without being able to convince and, and to uh, to transmit the results in plain language um, then there is very little chance of the optimal decision being taken and the results being implemented. Um, but it is also very very challenging because the deeper you go into analytics and the sharper one's skills become the more tempting is also going to be to choose the next sophisticated tool uh, and, uh, and to, to let yourself really be driven by data. That's how we call it, right? Data-driven decision. 
And in fact, that's a mistake because uh, data cannot really drive decisions. It can and it should inform the decisions, but not be the exclusive factor that plays into the decision-making process. Uh, sometimes data may not exist and decisions still have to be made, like, uh, for instance, in the early days of the pandemic when we had very few infectious um, uh, cases and yet we knew that uh, it's going to blow up. Uh, sometimes the data may not be fully relevant or maybe only partially accurate and decisions still have to be made. It's always better to have data than not to have it. Uh, nevertheless, keeping the intuition and the insight in mind is also crucial for understanding and putting the results of the analysis into context. And so the approach that we're taking in this program is uh, twofold. Uh, first of all, which runs as a red thread throughout the program, um, we are always focusing on bringing things back to intuition. So I mentioned earlier that we are always um, teaching tools, approaches, models, algorithms with respect or in relation to a specific application. Well, when we do so, we do not stop at deriving an answer. Now, this is the estimate, this is the prediction, and so on and so forth. We're always going one step further and building up the narrative around it. So we're really emphasizing, okay, how do we now um, recommend a certain course of action to the decision maker? How do would you put this into an output, into a report or a presentation? What's the optimal strategy for communicating this uh, to the specific audience that you have in mind? This could be, for instance, the results of a um, market segmentation analysis where you're looking at your customers. It could be the results of an um, employee churn analysis where you're looking at the drivers of, cust of employee satisfaction and uh, you need to understand uh, from an HR perspective what keeps your people happy. It's always crucial to, to really bring things back to the intuition, to the, to the practical meaning of, uh, of the numbers and of the models. So that's the first thing that we do, and that's pervasive throughout um, all the courses, uh, all the technical courses in the program. Now, the second thing that we do is that we have specific um, classes and workshops where we emphasize exactly this storytelling. We have one course on data visualization, which is about making meaning uh, out of large amounts of data and taking different approaches um, for holding a mirror up to the reality and seeing what uh, can you see through different lenses. And then we have a course on analytical leadership and a part of that course is precisely that. How do you engage with different audiences? How do you best uh, connect and communicate your results um, starting from the narrative that's emerging rather than the technical aspects of your analysis? This is another hot topic because of course, as, as we all know, uh, among the many, many different decisions that managers are taking, although uh, consciously or unconsciously, uh, typically the majority of them have some sort of ethical component. And usually this arises as soon as there are conflicts of interest between the different groups of stakeholders. Now, what the program does is um, helping students to um, anticipate and also to deal with these ethical concerns uh, as they arise and to finally understand essentially that there is a way of taking decisions in such a way that you can derive value and benefit for multiple stakeholder groups simultaneously. And again, we do this um, in two ways. Throughout the program um, in the first stage, Every time we talk about an application and every time we, we say, okay, how would you present this? How would you uh, explain this in simple language? We also do something else. We ask about what could go wrong and what could be the caveats that the analyst has to have in mind when um, dealing with an application. So for instance, if you are talking about a model that you would apply in HR to study employee retention, what would be the data that you would need for that model and um, to what extent is it ethical to access that data? What would be some considerations that you need to take in mind, including safeguarding, privacy, anonymization, um, the usefulness and the scope of predictions that might come out of these models, 
um, and so all of these are, are things that um, that we drill into our students uh, to think through. In marketing, for instance, we may think about models of customer segmentation. Then you talk, okay, uh, if you're thinking about targeted advertising, which is the ultimate end of the, in these models, uh, what are some of the ethical implications there and what does your model predict and how does that fit into the broader framework of the biases that are potentially um, there. So this is one uh, thing that we're doing, really building it in in every single application um, that, uh, that we're discussing. And the other thing that we're doing um, is again very much focused, very topical, again in the analytics leadership elective. Uh, we are having um, a part, a section that deals with ethical decision making and that talks about broad frameworks of um, ethical decisions. But we also have an entire course on um, analytics and society. This is a course that is in the core of the program, so all of the participants will be taking it. And the purpose of this course is um, to help them to deal with these ethical aspects through a mix of theory, examples, and practice. So on the theory side, we talk about normative and behavioral ethics, about systems of how decisions should be taken and how they are taken. And then we talk about um, different stakeholders groups, starting from um, the shareholders to the employees, uh, to the customers and the consumers, and, and finally to the um, overall society as a whole. Uh, and the suppliers that a company has. And so thinking about these groups in isolation and the different aspects that may arise in their relationship with them uh, helps to establish a framework into which the awareness for ethical decision making is enhanced. That's right. So sustainability, as the title may suggest, is, is um, rather broad um, content. It's, uh, it's a course uh, whose goal is to give an introduction to sustainability issues and challenges across all of the areas of the business. And also uh, not just in, uh, for corporate um, um, topics, but also in the public life uh, overall. And uh, the uh, course takes a rather um, broad perspective arts view, uh, thinking about the different functional areas, operations to marketing, to finance, to HR. So you may cover, for instance, um, sustainable work practices. You may cover things such as green investing and green bonds. Um, you may look at um, supply chain issues uh, in, uh, in sustainability, so, such as end of life. Um, um, for product and the product life um, management and so on and so forth. Um, it also deals with uh, understanding the constraints of the sustainability. There is um, some discussion or some, some ideas that sustainability always comes at a cost and that is true but uh, too much focus on the cost side obviously obscures the benefits. Huh? So it is a discussion about the quarter, the longer term perspectives and uh, this is what the course is also focusing on, the balance between the cost and the benefit, uh, together with some general uh, concepts and key topics such as sustainable development goals and, um, and their application in practice to, to any business uh, operation. Now, the uh, second course, the sustainability analytics, is um, an elective which the students may choose uh, to, to follow. And um, here there's two things that are different with respect to the, uh, to the main course, and that is that on one side, uh, we're going more deeply into the operations field. So a lot of the examples in this course are going to come from the operational side, from the functional area of operations of a company. And the reason for this is because really a lot of the sustainability issues are arising in the operational area. I'm thinking about the integrate, integrate uh, about the whole supply chain of the company. Uh, but also, at the same time, it's taking a more quantitative approach to it. So, one thing that uh, we have noticed uh, is that a lot of the discussion today about sustainability is about principles and concepts. But uh, when you come down to it, you need to have measurements. You need to be able to have KPIs and to follow um, what 
actually is happening uh, with um, the KPIs of a company. So as it turns out, there is a lot of variables that are being monitored and measured and collected. There's different data repositories, but there is largely an inconsistency between how things are being measured. And so the question from an analytical point of view is how do you deal with this inconsistency? To what extent can you trust this data? What is the usefulness of this data? How should such databases be set up? What should be measured? How should it be measured? Um, perhaps one of the most salient examples is the measurement, um, the capturing of um, scope 3 GHG emissions. Um, there is a well-established framework for scope 1 and scope 2, which relates to a company's own emissions in the, con um, the process of production. But scope 3 emissions relate to a company's whole supply chain, on which, of course, the company has much less control than on scope 1 and scope 2. And there is uh, not a whole lot of agreement on how these emissions should be measured. And these are the kind of topics that will be covered into quite some detail in the Sustainability Analytics Selective. Our expectation, our hope, is that uh, our graduates are going to fill in some of the um, data management positions, uh, data analyst positions in, uh, in major corporations, in uh, startups, or indeed in the public organizations. Data is everywhere. Uh, challenges are everywhere. Decisions need to always be taken. And decisions are generally better when data informs them. And so um, really the scope of application is um, as wide as our imagination can make it. Uh, which is why to say that um, uh, someone graduating from, uh, from the Master in Analytics and Artificial Intelligence, no matter whether their interest takes them rather towards finance or towards marketing or towards operations, although it's something entirely different, they will find um, a scope for applying these skills in practice and for getting a good position, a good professional um, career and perspectives uh, with it based on these skills. Now, what we would also expect is that they would be able to uh, raise, uh, to rise to the organization due to the fact that there is such a scarcity of people with um, both management and analytical skills. And so I would expect quite a high um, progression uh, through the career ladder and uh, potentially also because these uh, tools and these skills are rather universal, um, we expect that this would give them also the flexibility switching careers or switching industries uh, later on if they so choose. I would just like to, to emphasize that this program is, is, um, is one of a kind and um, because of this focus on the mix between theory and practice, um, the graduates will benefit from both the uh, knowledge and the expertise of um, world-class faculty, uh, my colleagues here at ESMT Berlin and our guest lecturers um, who will be visiting um, from elsewhere, but also from a very practical hands-on component together with our corporate partners, where the participants will have the chance to do their internships, uh, to do analytics in practice projects, and to really see live how analytics can uh, drive business and societal value. And so that will really put them in a good position upon graduation to fulfill their, their vision of uh, bringing value to society and, and to business. And that's why I'm very much looking forward to seeing them here in Berlin.